Bruchem Aboyim. We are now in the uh, ten days of tshuva between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We're two days away from Yom Kippur. So I thought the class tonight would be on a topic called action. All of Tanya is based on one verse from the Torah. It says, Ki because the thing is very close to you, Beficha in your mouth, Belvavka in your heart, Lasos, to do it. The last word in creation, when God created the world, was Lasos, to do. In fact, Kabbalistically, this world that we live in, there are four worlds, this world that we actually are in, is called the world of Asiya, the world of action. Everything goes back to action. We talk about it, we think about it. But the question becomes, do we do it? And as again, I've mentioned before, the talking and the thinking, the question becomes, does it come from the side of good or the side of evil? It's hard to know because we may just be outfoxed by the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, to talk about it and think about it, but not to do anything. And this way we feel righteous that we talked about it and we're thinking about it. It can best be, I think, understood through a story. There was a, there was a uh, story a few years back about a prominent politician who was accused of murdering one of his aides, a young lady. And one of the problems that they had was there was no body, but there was heavy circumstantial evidence to uh, seem to prove that this politician had killed her. And as you can imagine, this politician hired a very prominent law firm, million dollar lawyer. And the, def and the prosecution had a, an assistant, an assistant uh, district attorney who was uh, relatively green, out of school, and he was the one who was going to prosecute the case. And everyone just kind of thought that, well, you know, this big time lawyer was going to just outfox the kid and that would be the end of it and uh, this politician would get away scot-free. And the uh, date was set for the trial and the prosecution stood up and uh, began to present its case to the jury and to show how this mother and father had been robbed of their child and how she would not have a, be a mother, have children and painted a very bleak picture of a victim who had been victimized by this lecher, by this evil person. And as you can imagine, the defense attorney came, stood up and told the jury how he was a honorable person. He had been a, had a, he had a pristine record as a politician. He had helped many people. He was a good father. He was a good friend, a good wife, a good husband. And that he was, uh, not only that, there was no real evidence, there was no body, and he really had not done anything. And with that, the judge told them to proceed with the case. And the prosecution began to build the case one layer on top of another layer with heavy circumstantial evidence to prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this politician had killed this young lady. But what was amazing was with all of the witnesses that were brought, this million dollar lawyer, did, every time the judge asked if he wanted to cross-examine, he said no. Not only that, he did not have one objection to anything that the prosecution said. And even the defendant himself kind of looked confused because it almost seemed like he really wasn't in attendance and he really wasn't defending his client. After the prosecution had finished with all the witnesses, presented its case, the judge asked the defense attorney if he was ready to present his case. And the defense attorney turned to the judge and said the defense stands. No witnesses. And there was a hush in the crowd and everybody was quite confused as you can imagine. And the judge said, well, if that's the case, then we'll do with summations. And the prosecuting attorney stood up and again reiterated all the evidence to show that with beyond a shadow of a doubt that he could shown that this man had killed this girl even though there was nobody. And then the defense attorney stood up, faced the court, faced the jury, 
And he said to them, I'm sure everyone's wondering here why I didn't bring any witnesses and why I didn't object or cross-examine anyone. And he said, it's really very simple. You see, a week ago, I got a call from this young lady that she had had a spat with her boyfriend and she was not getting along with her parents. And what she did was she ran away to, to Mexico. She's alive in Mexico. In fact, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't bother bringing any witnesses, because she's alive. There is no body, because she's alive. Not only that, during the recess today, she told me that she will be here at 4 o'clock in the flesh. I can imagine that everybody was saying, you know, they were trying to, you know, make an innocent man guilty, on and on and on. And the judge then said to the, the jury in the court that they would wait until 4 o'clock. And uh, again, if the, if the young lady appears, there's case dismissed. What's, there is no case. And they waited, and 4 o'clock came and went. And people were looking at the door, but nobody was coming in. At 4.30, the door opens up. And in walks one of the female stenographers. And everybody was kind of up and then let down. And again, they continued to wait. Finally, at 5 o'clock, the judge turns to the defense attorney and says, we're no longer going to wait. If you have anything to say, say it now. Otherwise, I'm going to instruct the jury and they will deliberate. And the attorney got up and he said, it's not my job to prove that my defendant is innocent. All I have to do is give reasonable doubt. And the fact that even the judge at 4.30 when that door opened up looked back there waiting for her to come in. All of you turned to the door. And we're expecting this young lady to come in. That's reasonable doubt. And based on that, there is no way that you can convict my client because of that fact. And everybody's in the courtroom, brilliant, great defense. And with that, the judge instructed the jury to deliberate. And they went out, to, out of the court. And within five minutes, they returned. And you can imagine the defense attorney was smiling. And the judge asked the foreman, have you reached the decision? And the foreman said, yes, we have, Your Honor. What is that decision? The foreman said, guilty as charged. And there was a hush. And the lawyer screams out himself, mistrial. There's no way that you could come with that decision of guilty. And they took away the defendant. And as they were leaving the court, the defense attorney went to the foreman of the jury and he said, how could you find my client guilty? Everyone looked at the door. Everyone was watching. Everybody was waiting for her to come. There's reasonable doubt. How could you do that? Five minutes, you figured out the whole thing? And he turned to a woman that was on the jury and said, she was the one who convinced us. Talk to her. And he went up to the woman and he said, how could you convict my client? She said, it's really very simple. He said, but everyone was waiting. Everyone was looking. She said, you're right. He said, even the judge. She said, you're right. The only person that wasn't looking, the only person that didn't look at the door, the only person when the stenographer came in that didn't turn to the back of the court was your client. He never turned around. Because he knew that she was dead. Because he had killed her. Therefore, there was no way in the world that she was coming. Everyone else turned but him. And when the defense attorney went to go visit his client in jail, he said, you idiot, you fool. All you had to do was turn around and you would be a free man today. Action. That's all he had to do. Not just to think about it or to talk about it. Just connect it to an action and he would have gone free. And that's what we have on Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Talk about it and think about it. But if we don't turn around, if we don't look to the door, if we don't connect it to an action, 
then all of the thoughts that we have of getting better, all of the conversation that we have about getting better is useless. And the truth is that the defense attorney in heaven has no way to, to vindicate us of our sins for this year and to give us a better year next year. It's interesting, the Rambam says that one should see the whole world balanced between half merit and half deficit, between good and bad, and each person. And every deed that a person does, he should see himself balanced equally between good and bad. And the one sin or one mitzvah that he will do will make him either a tzaddik or a rasha on the side of good or the side of, uh, of evil, to be, pun to be punished, to have a good year or a bad year. Not just him, but that one deed also affects the whole world. That that one deed that he will do will change the balance of the whole world that is balanced equally. That one deed that he does. One deed, just one simple deed. They tell a true story of a family that was at the bus station in Tel Aviv. And it was Arab Shabbos. And they missed the bus. And they were standing there. And some young man in a car pulled up when he saw them there. And he was talking and, they, and he asked them that they needed a ride to B'nai Barak. So he volunteered to drive them to B'nai Barak. And that's what he did. And when he dropped them off, it was just before the Shabbat. And the Balabayat, the man who they had taken with his family, pleaded with him. Because if he would drive back to Tel Aviv, he would be driving on the Shabbat. He said, why don't you spend the Shabbat with us? And he was so persuasive that this young man, who was not religious at all, very secular, agreed to spend the Shabbat with his family. And he really had a wonderful, wonderful time. And after he was leaving, after Malaba Malka, after Shabbat was over, he turned to the host and he said, you know, I'm very secular, my friends are very secular, but I'd like to have do some mitzvah some good deed to connect to what I had here. This is a wonderful Shabbat that I spent with you. I'd like to remember it. Can you give me one mitzvah to do that my friends won't ridicule me about? And the man thought. And he says, you know, there's a law that we put on our right shoe first, then our left shoe, and then we tie our left shoe first, and then the right shoe. This is the law that we have in Shulchan Aruch. And that's, do that one deed. Just do that. And you'll be connected. One deed. And he said, fine. And the young man began to do it. Many times he would forget. And he would take his, go back and take his shoes off and re redo the whole thing. Right foot, left foot, tie the left and then the right. But he got into a habit of doing it. In the meantime, he was drafted into the Israeli army. And he was going through boot camp maneuvers. And even then, he would, even though he had his boots, he would still do that. Many times he would forget, have to take the boots off and start all over. And one day, as the, they were on the parade field getting ready to go on maneuvers, being taken by helicopter, he remembered he had put on his boots wrong. And he didn't want to tell his commanding officer what it was. So he told the commanding officer that he had a migraine, and he wanted to go back to the barracks to get some aspirin for this migraine. The captain wasn't happy, but he said, hurry up, we're about to leave. I don't want you to miss the uh, helicopter. So he went back to the barracks, took off his boots, retied them, and hurried back to the parade field. By the time he got back, the helicopter had left. That day, two Israeli helicopters collided in midair. Seventy-three men were killed, but he lived because of one little mitzvah. One little mitzvah. And that's what we need to know. That one is an important number. Because sometimes that's what we poo-poo. So it's only one. The answer is no. That even one is important. One more. Take water, boil it to 211 degrees, you have a hot cup of tea. 212, you can move a locomotive. The power of one. May God help us that we not only talk about it this year, think about it, about getting better, coming closer to God. But actually do something, pick something. Don't change your whole life. Take at least one thing, take one thing, and do it better than you did last year. 
And in this way, we break the back of the Yetzirah. And God, God willing, you'll have a good year. And through that one thing, so will the whole world in your merit. May God bless you all. It should be a Shana Tova, Masuka, that it should be a good year and a sweet year for you and your families. Thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbat.